think we're on. All right, so uh, for those of you that don't know me, um, my name's uh, Craig Chiffers. Um, just the FYI as well, the session is being audio recorded as well. All right. So before we go into it, I know uh, those of you that always attend, I'm normally the person sitting at the front that's blocking you guys between um, uh, me and beers, basically. So um, we can blame someone else. For, uh, of, uh, we can blame Greg, actually, this time, I think. You're taking the last <coughs> session, aren't you, Greg? Yeah, so it's Greg's fault. So I can talk for as long as I like. All right, so everyone, uh, especially me, um, has been harping on about moving from Skype for Business to Microsoft Teams. Uh, I even presented a session on this um, a couple of months ago. The problem is no one's talking about moving from traditional PABXs to Microsoft Teams. Hands up in the room here, those of you that aren't currently using Skype for Business, they have a legacy PABX on premise, and they're using it for telephony today, in and out. Or maybe you are using Skype for Business, but not for phone calls. Absolutely no one whatsoever. So this is going to be a great presentation. Oh, one, one person. All right, cool. I'm just going to talk to you for the rest of the, uh, <laughs> rest of the presentation. <laughs> Everyone else, just feel free to check your emails or whatever it is you want to do. Um, we're going to be talking about moving from legacy PABX to Teams. Um, when I say legacy, we're not probably talking about this kind of stuff. This is very old school. Um, I don't even know how old this is. Ancient. I think Telstra's still got some of this stuff uh, in the exchange, <laughs> possibly. Great. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we're not talking about this, but we are talking about potentially moving from your, your typical PABXs that you'll find out there. Here's a few of them. Um, this, uh, there's plenty more out there. Uh, I have included Link on this list as well, because we could potentially consider that to be legacy. Um, unless, of course, you're still stuck in the past and using OCS 2007. We haven't got anyone in the room here that's using OCS, no? No one? Yes? Yeah, it is still out there. Yes, I've seen it. I've seen it in the wild. No one at least are, are willing to admit it anyway. So when we're talking about moving to Microsoft Teams, be it from Legacy PABX or Skype or Google Hangouts, if you wish, the goal here is always about successful adoption. What the hell do we mean about successful adoption? Well, we mean we may put in a U-Butte new system, but if no one's using it, it's failed. You may have the best technology out there in the world, but if your users are not using it, the project has failed. So how do we do that? Well, there are some focus areas for success. Here's six of them. We're going to go through these, starting off with possibly the number one most important thing, and that's people. You need to get your people on board, first of all. People are the key to your success with Microsoft Teams. One thing I will point out, it's glaringly obvious to everyone in this room already, and I'm sure everyone here already uses Office 365, but to use Teams and to use Teams uh, to make PSTN calls, your users must be homed in Office 365, okay? There is no on-prem version of Microsoft Teams. Victor, is there gonna be an on-prem version of Microsoft Teams? I'm sure I asked you that six months ago. You don't know. Probably not. There will be no. <laughs> there, there will be no, but you've hit, heard it here first. There you go. Yeah. Hashtag no on-prem version. Yes. Okay. All right. Cool. So you've heard it from Victor and me. Your, your <coughs> users, glaringly obvious, but your users must be in Office 365. So we talked about users. What about our devices? the things that the users touch to use Teams. Well, we know everyone probably has a laptop or, uh, or a desktop computer. We can run the Microsoft Teams client on, on our laptop. But we may also have handsets out there as well. Hopefully, none of you guys out there have anything that looks or resembles anything like that still in the field. Hopefully, it sort of probably resembles maybe something that looks a little bit more like that. Um, our typical sort of user handsets and maybe our sort of headsets with maybe a nice proprietary uh, connection in there as well, just to sort of throw a few more challenges into the mix. So how do we go from this to, to this, to these sexy looking devices? So Yealink uh, or audio codes or, or others handsets and our nice wireless headsets. Well, we have some challenges that we need to, uh, well, we're gonna, need, we're gonna run into regardless of where we are. So everyone already knows how to use a desk phone. If you walk into an office and there's a desk phone set there on the desk, you're pretty much gonna know how it works. 
Most users know you might need to dial zero or nine to get an outside line, but you pick it up, you dial the number, and you're connected. So whatever replaces that handset on the desk, it needs to work the same or very similar, or at least better. <coughs> if we're replacing analog um, with IP phones, we need to be aware that that's not always possible. I've worked with customers who have analog handsets hundreds of meters from the nearest comms room on the end of a copper pair. That's never going to work with an IP phone. So that's something we need to take into account as well. And of course, the analog phone might actually be built into something. So it might not just be a phone on a desk. It could be an intercom in a lift or an intercom on a security gate or a door. And of course, uh, you may have special requirements. Um, in the previous slide, I showed that uh, headset with the proprietary connector. You may have those requirements or a loud ringer, perhaps. And of course, some people seriously want the ability to slam the handset down if someone upsets them. Um, as pointed out, that is definitely a stock photo. I had a quick Google image search prior to uh, presenting, and that was the best one that I could find. So uh, all rights to uh, deposit photos there. So as I said, these are the devices that the users touch. How do they feel? Are they equal or better than what users are using today? how they function will directly affect how your users perceive Microsoft Teams. If, if you put a handset in front of them and that handset is rubbish and doesn't work properly, the user's going to be like, ah, Teams is rubbish. That's, that's their interaction with Microsoft Teams. And of course, ask yourself, are handsets even still required? We're moving into a more future way of working with laptops, with headsets, working from home, working from the coffee shop or the pub, if you wish if there's good Wi-Fi there. We're potentially no longer locking users to desks. Why do we potentially want to deploy a handset to that desk and lock that user to that desk when everything else we're giving them is all about mobility? So off the back of that, if we do want to deploy handsets, there are a few that are available today. Um, there are more in the pipeline as well. Those of you that went to Ignite will have seen Polycom's um, iterations as well. I haven't included those up there though because they're not available today. So if you went out and you wanted to buy handsets today and headsets, that is what's available right now. A couple from Yealink, um, audio codes as well, including the uh, meeting room systems there, and some headsets, uh, both from Plantronics, Jabra, <coughs> and Sennheiser as well. Microsoft have produced a really handy uh, list of supported devices. Um, if you want to access that link, just go to my blog, blog.chivers.com forward slash links. The link is at the top of the screen there. That's a, a shameless plug for my blog there. It's throughout the slides, so don't worry if you miss it the first time, all right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we've dealt with the users so far. We've got the new headsets. We've got the new handsets. What about our meeting rooms? Hands up who still has one of those in their meeting room, or who even potentially... <laughs> you love the old school technology. Um, I love these things, they're great. I've actually never used one in terms of the, the, so this, those of you that have never seen one of these things before, it's a whiteboard and it has a printer attached to it, which I understand, although I've never used one, will we'll give you a, an A4 sheet paper of what you've drawn on the whiteboard, which is great. It's like a hard copy. Um, super old school, but it works. So here's a sort of typical meeting room. I see these. Uh, in many customer sites that I walk into. Um, replace the, uh, the paper there maybe with a whiteboard, maybe replace the screen there with a projector. Um, not sure why there's two phones on the desk there. Uh, we see that quite often. Sometimes one will be for internal calls only. Um, the other one might be for meeting, meeting room calls or conference, conference calls. That one might have a sticky label on it with the phone number, etc. that people can call in on. Really, really sort of old school stuff happening there. Everyone sort of knows how it works, but we can do a lot better than that. So here are our challenges with, with a meeting room such as that. And I see this day in, day out. So we've got outdated technology in these meeting rooms. We've got um, whiteboard printers, uh, TVs, projectors, old school conference room handsets. We've also potentially have limited connectivity as well. So again, we're giving our users laptop devices, but we're not giving them the ability to walk into a meeting room and charge those devices. So people are bringing dead laptops to meetings, which means that they can't present or they can't view content. Even worse, we're not providing Wi-Fi within the meeting room. Several of the customers that I work with 
have no Wi-Fi coverage in their meeting rooms. Again, we're giving people mobility devices, they can't use them. And of course, a big massive red flag that a lot of people don't talk about is existing video conferencing solutions. Hands up here who has a Polycom or a Cisco um, system within their, their office or within customers' sites at the moment. Keep your hand up if you're not 100% certain how you're gonna integrate that with Teams. Unless, of course, um, what most people are telling you to do, which is eh, just maybe get rid of that and buy a new one. <coughs> yeah, okay. That's a big problem. So how do we go from this to potentially something that looks a little bit more like this? I like the, uh, like the table there as well. Yes, <laughs> apart from uh, hiring a, day, uh, a, a designer and buying a bigger TV and painting the walls white and getting rid of the flowers and the clock <laughs> and moving to another building. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's step one, get a new office. Well, as I said, we have some challenges here. We, we need to replace that outdated technology where we can. So we need to get rid of those projectors, those whiteboards with uh, digital displays, those uh, whiteboards that you can print things from. And we need to replace those conference room phones with Teams room systems where we can. Uh, I had a fact the other day that, that said that simply uh, enabling video during a meeting increases attentiveness. Most people, and I'm guilty of this as well, will sit in a meeting and someone's blabbering on about sales figures, et cetera. You're not that in thrill to, to listen to it, to be honest. Um, and you're sat there clearing your inbox. And you get to the end of the meeting and you wonder what on earth that meeting was even about and why you even needed to be there. Enabling video increases attentiveness. You're on screen, someone can call you out that you're looking at your iPhone updating your Twitter. We need to enhance connectivity in these rooms. We need to add additional power points for charging devices, mobile phones, laptops, and we need to ensure that there's adequate network coverage in these rooms as well. If you go in there to present content um, from a laptop and you've got no Wi-Fi coverage, you're probably going back out to download it on USB, come back in, present the content. Rather than starting your meeting on time, it's now 15 minutes late. And of course, if we can reuse existing investments, we should. If the business has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on, uh, on Polycom or Cisco equipment, we need to reuse that where we can. It's gonna be very difficult to present a business case back to the business and say, I know two years ago you bought this <coughs> brand new video conferencing solution that I told you was gonna be great, but now we wanna try Microsoft Teams and that doesn't quite work with that, so we need to replace it again. What do you think they're gonna say? So here's what's available today in your meeting room space. Got quite a few uh, different manufacturers who are creating devices for meeting rooms. Uh, here's just a very quick snapshot of it. Again, um, those of you who have already seen the Surface 2 uh, hub, that's actually not yet available. Um, very excited for that to come out though. Uh, I've seen a demonstration of this, they're, they're very sexy. Can't wait, can't wait to get my hands on one of those. When do we reckon they're coming out, Victor? <laughs> soon, good answer, yes, soon. Um, the, the second quarter of 2019, I'm told. Apparently. So it's kind of a yeah, June, July time frame for the yep. virtual ones. Okay. All right. Can and you're going to bring one in for us so we can play around with it, yes? Yep, all right, cool. Good stuff. <laughs> and of course, again, one will work, yes, it will. Um, and again, as I said, uh, Microsoft do have these devices listed on their website as well. There's that link again, just in case you uh, didn't grab it the first time. Of course, if we want to reuse our existing meeting room investments, um, there are solutions out there that will enable us to do that. Um, here are two that I just literally grabbed from the internet, Pexip and, uh, and Polycom. So Pexip Infinity and Polycom Real Connect. Um, my understanding is Pexip Infinity run their own service. Polycom Real Connect are licenses that you can buy from uh, Office 365 directly. Um, both work very similarly as well. So these enable you to join your, um, your Cisco, your Polycom, your life-size uh, room systems into Microsoft Teams and Skype for Business meetings natively. Don't need to replace that equipment, you can reuse it. Any questions so far about meeting rooms or people? Nope, okay, all right. On to PSDN connectivity. 
how do we connect Microsoft Teams to the PSTN? Um, we've been through this plenty of times before, but for those of you that aren't aware, there are pretty much two choices for connecting to the PSTN in Australia. Um, you can either go down the direct routing route, or you can buy TCO from, uh, from Telstra, or Telstra calling for Office 365. Um, Victor, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you can mix and match the two as well. There's no reason why you cannot have direct routing and TCO within the same tenant. I'm you promised it will work. You absolutely can. Yep, so cool. There is no, and you can also have the Microsoft Point Cloud uh, outside of Australia, so UK, US, yep. mixed on top of all these. Absolutely, you can. One thing you can't do at present is add TCO calling to a tenant not in Australia. Okay. I'm told it is coming at some point, much like the Surface 2 Hub. But um, it's, uh, it's on its way. So very quickly, direct routing. Um, the way it works is you deploy a, oh, it works. I'm so excited to use this thing. I got this the other day. <coughs> it's, uh, look at that. Um, so uh, you basically deploy an on-premise session border controller. You may already have one from Ribbon or Audio Codes or others. Um, needs, to make, needs to be running the latest firmware, though. You connect that with your existing SIP trunk or ISTM trunk, if you wish. Um, and over the internet, it connects up to the Microsoft Teams phone system or, uh, or Skype for Business as well. And that's a simple way of being able to make calls. I will talk to you afterwards about that, Victor. Um, that's a simple way of being able to make calls from the cloud it, using your existing infrastructure, your existing SIP trunks, uh, or your existing ICN trunks. It's also a great way of, if you perhaps want to trial Microsoft Teams and you want to use part of your indial range, you can deploy direct routing and reuse that indial range and send some of those numbers up to Microsoft Teams and keep some of those numbers on-prem for your existing legacy PABX until you're ready to make the move completely. TCO um, offers you a managed voice solution. So instead of you deploying an SBC on-prem, they, they basically have a big one in their data center and they handle inbound and outbound calls for you. All you need to do is buy the licensing and the calling plans from them. So Direct routing best suits pretty much customers who want to use their existing ISDN or SIP providers or need uh, support for devices that need to remain on-prem. So if you've got those analog devices that you cannot get rid of that need to remain part of the phone system, the only way you're going to get that to work is by using direct routing. Um, of course, if you want to integrate with your existing PABX or, your, as I said, if you've got number ranges that you'd like to use within Microsoft Teams but you don't want to forward the entire 100 number range block to Telstra, Direct routing is the way to go. Whereas TCO is really good if you've got greenfield sites that you need to provide PSTN connectivity to. It's up and running really ridiculously fast. Uh, I mean, I literally, I got the email through to say, hey, here's your block of numbers, assign them to the users, and they're up and running in 10 minutes. Crazy fast, so it's really good for greenfield sites. Of course, if you have customers who have no requirements for uh, on-prem analog support, um, no requirements to either migrate blocks of DIDs or if they want to migrate the entire number range, um, you can do that with TCO. And of course, customers that want to simplify their telephony infrastructure. So if you want to get rid of your on-prem SBC, your on-prem Skype for Business environment, and let's be honest, who doesn't? TCO is a really cool way of going about it. All right, let's talk about analog devices very quickly. So. Um, who here has any kind of thing that looks a little bit like this still in their environment? Who, ha who has a boom gate at home? <laughs> yes, you, you have a boom gate at home as well, do you? Right, okay, cool. You've got all the technology. So these are analog devices. Um, we need a plan to deal with these analog devices. We need to make a decision on whether we want to remove them from the environment. If we can replace them with something else, so if it's an analog handset, can we put in place a, uh, a Teams compatible device. If we can't, and the customer wishes to continue using the analog device, um, you're stuck with direct routing. There are some other considerations too. Say for instance, uh, your customer uses contact center. Um, <coughs> can Teams support it? There are uh, auto attendants and call queues available at the moment in Microsoft Teams. They work very well, but the features that are available aren't a, a direct copy of what could be available within your call center software. So that's something to consider as well. And are there other integrations or requirements that you potentially have? Um, are there any legal requirements? 
or have you got something funky that ties into a billing system that, that doesn't currently work with Microsoft Teams? Again, they're kind of edge cases, but I have seen them out there in the wild. Training and adoption. This is absolutely critical to your success with your deployment of Microsoft Teams. Cannot stress this highly enough. So there's five. But again, that's a, that's, that's a stock image as well. I didn't paint my hand when I got up this morning. Uh, there are five key points to make when it comes to training and adoption. Again, um, this comes down to, to people at the end of the day. And as I said at the very top of this presentation, people are key to ensuring success. So how do we ensure success with Microsoft Teams? Well, we need to ensure that our, product, that our project is sponsored by the right people. What do I mean by that? Well, um, if you have uh, a bunch of executives that are technophobes that hate change and they want to come on your, your Microsoft Teams pilot, how do you think that's going to go? Maybe we need to identify people in our organization that love change and they're excited for change and that love technology and they want to come on board first to make everyone else feel excited about what we're doing. We need to ensure that we communicate with people about what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. Um, I've been out uh, at a customer before who has come Monday morning, just ripped all the phones off the desks and put new handsets out on the desks and sort of said, oh, she'll be right, mate. Um, that's not a great experience as a user. You walk in and you think someone's probably sat at your desk that wasn't there on Friday um, or that someone's stolen your phone and what's this newfangled device and how does it work? So. Communication is key. We need to tell people what's going to happen. We're going to change your phone. We're, you know, we're going to change your desk phone. You're going to get a new phone number. You're going to get a new handset. You're going to get a new headset. And when is it going to happen? We need to ensure that we're giving people the right technology. We don't just want to buy the cheapest handset or the cheapest headset out there. Remember that that is your user's connectivity to Microsoft Teams and their experience with it. If that sucks, their experience sucks. We need to ensure that everyone's trained and feels confident and comfortable with the new technology. So uh, that goes from taking people through, uh, through training classes to literally handing out A4 sheets of paper and saying, here's how meetings are going to work. And we need to ensure our support staff are trained and ready to deal with questions on day one. We do not want users calling the help desk and saying, hey, I, this meeting room doesn't work and support says, I don't, don't know anything about that device or this meeting room. That's not a great experience. There's that link one last time. If you haven't had a copy to write it down. <laughs> uh, there is already a copy of this presentation there as well that you can download if you want to um, revisit the slides. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, so all you're effectively doing is you're taking them off of the legacy PABX and you're plugging them into the SBC and saying, that's now our analog phone system. What it does mean is that you can create uh, short dials between those analog handsets and Microsoft Teams users. So if where before someone, you know, security is extension 5000 on the handset, you can still dial 5000. Security can now be a Teams user and the call still happens. The users don't, you know, don't need to understand the underlying technology. Any other questions? Alrighty. Thank you very much.